This week, the theme is curb appeal. We've got live Q&As, a watch party, a $250 Home Depot gift card giveaway, as well as new and recommended content. You'll find all of that here, as well as on our website at thisoldhouse.com. We're kicking off the week with our very own carpenter, Nathan Gilbert. Hey, Nathan. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Good, how are you, how are you doing? Doing well, how was your weekend? Uh, it was great, got outside, lots of good stuff. Just got some good weather. Yeah. How about you? Nice. Good, good. Got some yard work done. It's beautiful out. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I understand today you've got a awesome, interesting, cool tool to demonstrate something that you yeah, absolutely. on Ask This Old House segment. Um, can you tell us about the segment and also the tool? So the segment was filmed a few months back and I think it's aired. And what I did was I cut and asked this old house logo on a piece of pine that I had stained. And I was kind of demonstrating how the machine works, how the tool works, um, how to put a cut file down. So we kind of covered some of that information. And when we were talking about curb appeal coming up, I thought, well, you know, what's something that I can do to, to my house or a customer's house to, to spruce it up? And the first thing I saw, thought of was a new sign or a new home number on the front of the house. So I thought I could create a cut file through my shaper and cut out an example for you guys and actually have that here today. Almost done, but I wanted to finish it for you guys. Awesome. Okay. And the shaper, um, tell us, let's talk about that for a minute because that's a, it's a really expensive tool. It's it is. Very spe specific. You're, you, could, you could do this project without that tool, even though you're yeah. going to demonstrate it. But let's talk about the tool for a minute. So it's a big investment, you know, it's, it's simply not something that everyone's going to go out and buy, but someone who works a lot in their in their shop or wants to take this tool with them on the road, it's a, it's a really good one to have. If you don't have space for a large CNC bed, this is actually the world's first handheld CNC router. So what I do is I push it around manually and the there's marking tape set down on my work surface and it makes up for any errors as I push it along. It's pretty cool. That's crazy. So the, it, the bit follows along something. Are you watching it on a screen and it and it it follows? You're following a pattern on the screen. Yeah. Let me show you the top side of it. Okay. So there's a there's a, a screen on the top, and it's got a lot of different options there. And you put your cut file in, and then you'll see your work piece here after you create a, a work zone. You'll see it, and you'll follow the line, and it'll actually tell you which direction to go. Um, you know, you need to input what kind of cutter you're using, uh, how how far down you want it to go. But once you have all the information in there, you just run it along. That's very cool, and you can yeah. you can customize anything, right? Like you can put in files to that thing and download. Yes, it. you can go remote. I have a I have a USB file in here right now. Um, different options if you don't have the ability at home to create one of these files, you can reach out to the brand shaper of the company and they'll help you create a cut file and send it to you. Or they have a community called the Shaper Hub where you can go on and you can connect with other people who've already created cut files. So say you want to make a cribbage board or a cutting board, there might be a file already out there that you can send from your iPad or computer straight to your origin, create a works, workspace or work surface, and then cut it right out. That's really cool. I've seen that yeah. thing in uh, demonstrated before when it first came out it's 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 amazing if you yeah. the thing that you're doing today if you didn't want to make that investment your homeowner you want to you want to accomplish the same sort of project what steps would you go to if you wanted to do the same thing yeah it's definitely achievable um, you know if you had a bandsaw or a scroll saw you could cut out yourself a nice little piece of wood or I'm actually using PVC today just I had some leftover from a job and it's rock resistant and uh, but you can cut out your piece. You could do one of two things. You could go online or you could go to the store. And you could buy the letters and the numbers that you want to do your, your street address. Or you could go onto your computer and create a stencil. So find a font you like, type out what you want, put it on your work piece, trace it out. You could carve that or you could paint that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so you have some options. You don't have to you don't have to invest twenty five hundred. You don't have to run out and buy one of these. But there's a lot of uh, a lot of more uses than just cutting signs with this. So um, it's definitely a good investment for myself for the carpentry business. Yeah, woodworkers, carpenters, got it. Mm -hmm. And um, you you mentioned the tape. So can you show us? Can you can you move the camera around and show us? Yeah. 
how it's laid out and we'll talk about how this okay will be up. yeah so what i'm going to show you right now is this is the piece i'm working on okay you can you can see the the marking tape is on there yeah and uh it's azac pvc trim board so i still left the uh the guard on there so i can run the router over it and not scratch up the uh the surface at all and uh, so what you do is you lay this tape out, and then you create a workspace. So you actually scan, you, you move the router back and forth, and you create a workspace, and that goes into the computer, and it creates a picture of what you're cutting on, and then you bring your file, and you can position it where you want and drop it right there. That's, oh, that is really cool. That's some sophisticated yeah. machinery right there. Okay. I'm jealous. I want to try that thing out. Can you show Anytime. us? Uh, show it. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get my eyes and ears on. I left, uh, an example piece I have here is uh, 317 Pleasant Street. So I've left that one out, we'll cut that real quick, and then I'm gonna pry this up, clean out the edges a little bit, and then I'll show you how it turned out. Great, great. Okay. So Nathan's cutting out a, a quick one, number one actually, and it's going to be pretty quick. So stick with us, and then he's going to flip out, show us what it looks like when it's done, just how precise it is. And what he has is a stencil, not a stencil, but he has a, a map basically on the on the work surface. He's looking in the camera, and he's following the guide on the camera. And he has to keep the bit. Tolerance and it will fill in the rest. It doesn't have to be perfectly precise. It the, the machine picks up any any movement that he's making that may not be perfect, and it'll make it up because the bit the spindle actually adjusts automatically in that range. So it it it's pretty foolproof and offers a lot of room for error or uh, adjustment and we're going to see in a minute how well he, how well he did. All right, so now I'm going to, I finished up that one. I'm going to pry this up now. What you do is you put double-sided tape on the back side because I actually cut the whole perimeter of this out. That double-sided tape keeps it from moving around as you cut it. So now he's just vacuuming off the surface all the extra dust that may not have made it in the in the hose when he was cutting and show us, show us what it looks like. Some, that's some heavy-duty double-sided tape you got there, Nathan. Yeah, I use uh, carpet tape, and man, it, it gets a good bite. There we go. All right, so here is what it looks like before I kill the film off. Can you hold that up again just for a second? Yeah. So we see all the little domino-looking looking marks, and those were the those helped guide the the router in the in the screen helps yep. you can how to, how to follow it, how to follow the pattern. I really like actually cutting this PVC with this AZAP film still on it. But keep it really clean. So this is what it came out like. That looks awesome. You just did that one right there just now? Yep, I just did this one here. And uh, so what you do is you actually cut the perimeter first, and then you turn into pocket mode, and you clear the space in between. So you get these really precise lines. Very nice. So yeah. when, you, when you put it in pocket mode, does it, if it's in a certain, within that circle range, will it kind of fill, it'll just cut it itself? Yes. So you almost put it into a free a free mode where you can just move it any direction you want 
and it knows to stop before it hits the perimeter. Um, what I like to do too is you, you do have to think out how you're going to cut this piece out because once you cut through that marking tape, the computer can no longer recognize that. So what I like to do is sometimes do the perimeter first, and then I come up and I do lettering as I follow up. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here's that double-sided tape on the back okay. there. So uh, now that I have this cut out, I think I'll take maybe a chamfer or a round over bit and just a regular router, and I'll probably ease these edges, and then I'll take a little bit of black paint and highlight the letters and the numbers so it really pops from the street. Very nice. Yeah, and being out of PVC, it's going to last forever. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, what kind of router will you use to do the roundovers? So For the roundovers, um, I have the DeWalt uh, laminate router. And um, okay. you know, that, that new cordless one, I think we had talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, so I'll probably toss a, a router bit in that and just clean it up. So just a handheld, single hand. Um, simple round over or chamfer you said in the chamfer describe the chamfer versus a round over for folks uh, uh, chamfer is uh, most likely a 45 degree angle and it'll have a little bearing on the bottom that guides it and it'll just ease that edge and I think that's a pretty clean look pretty subtle yeah. very nice yeah and it'll shed water too sort of not yeah. that you worry about it with a with PVC trim but yeah yeah it's nice uh, to have a few scraps laying around yeah. that I can stuff like this with it and I could have done it out of out of wood too. Um, I was I thought about it earlier, but it is tough to source some of the materials right now with uh, some of the lumber yards being closed. Oh sure. So I went out to my shop and I had a nice piece of PVC kicking around and cut it out of that. Nice. Now speaking of bits, what did you use a different bit to do the lettering and the number versus to cut out the shape around the form around the edges? So. For this entire project, I used a uh, eighth inch upcut bit, and I, I think I have one an extra one in the kit there. But it's a really narrow, straight bit, spirals up, and that helps lift the debris up and out, so the vacuum can suck that out. Okay. Um, pretty much, you can use any quarter inch bit you can get your hands on, as long as it can plunge down and work. Yeah, the quarter, the the upcut bits are good for plunge cutting, right? For that reason, mm -hmm. especially if you have dust extraction connected to the router. Like you said, yep. it'll, pull, it'll pull that material away. Going through a harder wood or a plywood, I might try and step that up to a quarter inch upcut, a little bit more stable. But since this is just a light PVC, the uh, eighth inch is uh, accurate and strong enough. That's great. Well, yeah. Before we get into any Q and A's, um, what other projects have you done with that? Um, I think I have one right over my shoulder here. I did that saw storage box. And uh, actually, I think one of the coolest ones I did was I grabbed it off of the Shaper Hub, and it is that right there. So what that does is it hooks onto the festival hose, and then this little bit on the bottom here grabs the cord from the Shaper, and it helps control those and put those together all the way back to the vacuum. Oh, nice. What did you make that out of? Is that That's, a, that's just a piece of plywood right there, some scrap plywood I had laying around. So I made, I made a half dozen of those. And uh, I keep them in my little shaper kit for when I, when I get the shaper out, I connect everything and it keeps it tight. Very cool. And is that yeah. three, was that three quarter? Yep, that's three quarter stock right there. So well, actually, what, what I'm filming on right now is actually my shaper table. So I have these, I call them tiles with shaper tape on them. So, and those I don't cut through. Those I just, I keep guiding in front of it. And I cut my workpiece and below the workpiece, I have spoil board that I can cut into and it's replaceable. It's all uh, MDF board. And um, what I can do with the tiles, I have a, a four by four grid that I can kind of move stuff back and forth and kind of get stuff tight. And then for projects I need to, I can put the double sided tape on it, stick it down, slide the board up against it and lock it in. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for showing us that. It's uh, I'm, I'm, next time I see you, I want to I want to try that thing out. Come on down. We'll put you through a trial run. I'm sure you've got the chance to use that in some of the uh, some of the shows, though. They're at a lot of the uh, yeah woodworking shows, but also now they're becoming more popular in some of your local specialty woodworking stores. Um, I know we have one not too far down Rhode Island from me that has one on display. I'm not sure if you can cut with it or not. I think it's more of a uh, they do have an air cut mode where you can almost pretend like you're cutting, but the cutter doesn't plunge at all. You're just guiding it along the path. Yep. Yeah, one of the local paint stores here has has a, a display and a setup, and they were going to do a demo 
a couple weeks ago, but because of the current environment, they were they had to cancel that. So I think they're trying to figure yeah, out. Then. So very cool. All right, should we do some question and answer? Yeah, let's get into it. All right. So Richard on YouTube, thanks for joining. Richard is asking about the labels. I, I assume he means those that tape. Are there are, are they needed and uh, for each letter in the sign? So. You want to talk so about this, this marking tape right here, um, when you buy the kit, it comes with three rolls, but then if you need more, I think it's like 10 or $12 a roll, but it lasts quite a while, especially if you put it onto pieces that you're not going to cut like I have. Mm -hmm. um, and on the entire roll, no two are alike. So that way the computer knows that, it's not, it, that there's no duplicate dominoes anywhere on the workpiece, so it can locate itself. And at any time, I forget the exact amount, but I think the, the router likes to see between like five and ten of these markers to really pinpoint. When you get away from it, say I brought it down to a lower corner and the eyes of the camera came off of the tape, you're going to see a little red beacon at the top right and it's going to say, hey, redirect it a little bit and uh, try and pick up some more of these, some more of these markers. So um, to reiterate, so the, so the tape is really just to create a map of the entire surface and the work surface you're doing. And you have to put some above the surface and below the work surface. Yep. So the, the router, in, and then the router reads all of that. Yep. And, and you place your pattern on that screen. Can you tilt the screen forward so that and just see the see it again? Yeah. So that's, so there. I mean, yeah. So there's the mark and tape showing up. So if I had placed my cut piece on top of that, you would see a line that I would be pushing and following along. Actually, now that we have this, here's the on-off switch here. You have some uh, speed control, uh, dust extraction right here. Um, what's kind of nice, this pops off, and you can access and change your bits, or you can even remove this entirely and put a different bit into it. Cool. Yeah. That and helps. Also cool is uh, scaling. You can you can scale very easily on this. So once I pick my piece I want to cut, I can make it larger or smaller. So referring back to the Ask This Old House episode where I featured this, I did a very small logo on that pine. But before I had gone there, I had had a piece of a Dantec and I cut one that was about three feet wide by about you know eight inches tall. And that was with the same file. I just scaled it differently. Yeah. All right, Richard, hopefully that helps. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, Steve on YouTube is asking. So we're talking, uh, we're talking curb appeal and mm -hmm. demonstrated a, an address sign for a potential option and, and gave us some ideas on how you might achieve that without the shape or origin. And Steve's asking on YouTube, can I get tips on what kind of wood to use for outdoor projects like benches and sh um, sheds? You know what kind of and maybe what kind of waterproofing you should use that's a really good question because you definitely want to be con conscious of what woods you're using in different applications say you're doing a raised garden bed you know you wouldn't want to use pressure treated material that because there's chemicals in there so it's good to go with uh, your cedars if you have the availability to go I would always use cedar um, I had thought about making this sign out of a mahogany um, it's tough to find real wide mahogany now um, Hardwoods are great for outdoors because they have tight grain and they're not going to rot as easy as like a pine. Um, for simple projects, pine is still still good because it's cost efficient. You yeah. know, you can get up locally at any store, and um, it's easy to work. You know, the hardwoods you're going to go through more saw blades. If you're going with like a teak, you know, or uh, an exotic wood, yeah, you're going to go through some blades. It's tougher, a lot of more pre-drilling. Um, a lot more time and thought going into the project where pine you could just buzz right through it. Yeah, and your and your point about the pine, if you were to use pine, you want to use a really good um, primer, exterior yep. primer, and exterior paint over that, and then it, that'll last, right? You want to? Yeah, um, it's harder now to find any oil-based paints um, because of the kind of restrictions that have been put on those. But if you can get your hands on an oil-based primer sealing the ends of anything you work on is huge. Say you're redoing some, some fascia or some soffit and you have a scarf joint, you're connecting two pieces. It's really important to seal those ends because that water wants to get in there and wick up and that's where your rot is going to start. Good point. Good point. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah, you can, 
I, you know, we always talk about you can get lost in the uh, at the home center walking down the aisles. The amount of options for waterproofers and sealers, stains, um, there's a ton of options. So just go check them out and see what's in your price range. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Tech Ed Fireman on YouTube who says hey. it's easy. Fireman. Oh, nice. There we go. Uh, Ari, the, re regarding the Shaper Origin, it's an easy machine to get used to. My high school students pick it up easily. So, Very cool. Very cool. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, Tech Ed, thanks for joining us, and thank you for teaching, and uh, kudos to you. I was a teacher. I wish I had one of these in my high school shop when I was yeah, a kid. It, that's awesome. That's, yeah. Um, talking about some other projects, I know we're going off topic here, but some other ideas for carpentry-wise sprucing up curb appeal. Yeah. Um, window boxes are great. Um, you can make those easily and pick up some soils and flowers and spruce those up. Um, you do those out of cedar? I would do those. You can do those out of pine or cedar, um, whatever you can get your hands on. PVC is not a bad option because, you know, you're, it's going to be wet a lot. Mm -hmm. um, another option that I think people don't think about is uh, adding some of the decorative Phipon accessories to their homes where you can put caps over windows or corbels over an underhang mm -hmm. and Phipon for people that don't know is just it's just foam it's like a rigid foam that has been shaped or molded and then painted with a primer so it takes paint well when you when it gets to your home they're easy to put up and rot resistant and you can add a lot of curb appeal quickly very nice very nice yeah. and regarding the address uh sign that you made you could, I assume, you'd put the in a post on the in the in your front yard, or you can mount it to the house. If you were going to put yep. it in a post, what are your thoughts on that? How you would go about that? I believe there's a, we have a we we have a segment on our website that shows the whole process, but wondered if you could talk about it with folks. Yeah, if you if you go and you put it on a post with a wood post on the ground, you definitely don't want to get lumber that's ground contact rated, so some freshly treated stock. Um, depending if you're going to put anything else on it, a 4 by 4 would be good for that. Um, we had talked last week about different types of um, ways to stabilize that post, whether it's cement or that new two-part bag that you break and you shake and you pour the foam in and it blows up. I still haven't had a chance to cut one of those open yet. But uh, I'd probably go with a bag of cement or even some stone dust. Some stone dust and some water. It compresses well. Um, you're not really going to put anything too heavy on it. Great. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Tony on Facebook, who's been watching on VHS for a long time. Since, since nice. So thanks for joining us, Tony. Um, Steve, thanks for writing in. And let's see, Mike on YouTube. How do you know where to put the guide tape for the router? So getting back to the to the sheet, yeah. you know where to put that that tape. They recommend that you do about three to four inch spacing. Um, for the tape and for myself with this reusable piece I added more I did it every two inches that way I can pick up more of the markers and it will be a more accurate cut um, so I'll do a tight layout at the top and then on the piece itself I'm cutting I'll space those about three two to three four inches apart they don't have to be perfectly parallel with each other they can be tapered um, you can get pretty creative with the layout of your tape you just you want to have more than less, because as we said, it, it works on those markers. So you don't want to get, you don't want to cut through one and then backtrack and then not have that marker anymore to help guide itself. More is more is better. All right. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for yeah. joining joining us and thanks for the question. Uh, here's another question uh, from a, maybe the same Mike on YouTube. If you're doing board and batten siding, do mm -hmm. you, you think cedar breather is needed? And how would you layer the exterior wall? So. Um, if if cedar breather is in your budget for that project, then I would definitely use it. It's great to have that 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 ability to dry out the wood from the backside. Um, if you don't, because that the rolls are not cheap for that stuff, and it'll add up, especially if you're doing a lot of siding with it. And there's a lot of prep that goes into it with layering it, so it overlaps and drains down. Um, you know, I wouldn't. I would recommend uh, a Tyvek or a tie bar behind it. You know, some people are shying away from that now, but something is better than nothing. Um, even tar paper, if you have a little tar paper, still seems to be pretty efficient. I think we talked about that last week. Tar paper is tried and true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but no, um, just 
make sure that you're overlaying your the weatherproofing behind there so if water does get behind it drains down yeah think like water right mm -hmm. everything sheds just like on the river absolutely all right all right thanks mike uh we'll get time for a couple more questions we have uh, NA on YouTube. How difficult is it to repair a sinking attached porch? Mm. Uh, there's a lot of lots to explore there, so I'll let you. Yeah, I feel like that's really common because back in the day, you know, there wasn't a lot of code about footers, so people would just scratch back the topsoil and maybe throw a cinder block or or a small little pad uh, to be for the footers for all that framing. And over time, you know, it's dropped and settled. Um, if there's an overhang on the porch and that's still in good shape, um, I would recommend picking up some 2x12 pressure treated stock and supporting that with some posts. That's a whole different lesson there. Actually, we covered that a little bit in Newton during my apprenticeship on what we did to, uh, to stabilize the porch roof as we redid the deck below. Um, but stabilize the roof and start to explore. Pull up the decking. Uh, check for the hangers on the house. You know, if it was older, there's probably no hangers. There's probably just a few spikes holding it onto the house. Um, it's very difficult to dig a footer underneath a deck. So analyze it and say, well, is it worth my time to just tear this off, start fresh, and build back up instead of crawling underneath there and trying to dig a hole? It's not fun. No. It's super common, too, that uh, I know I've, I've run across this a fair amount in my area where you see a, a piece of pipe coming up from the ground and it's just sticking in or on top of a, a, some, a big chunk of concrete, you know, maybe two, three feet, three feet down. A lot of times that, that, that pipe rots and is yeah. rusts it's out. It's very, very difficult to replace that. You know, you want to open it back up and get some new pressure treated or some new steel in there. Right. Um, you know, to use our, our area as an example, we have uh, a low you frost line. The, you guys watch them. So we, uh, we go down four feet with our footers here. So, you know, if you can do that to get below the frost line so you can avoid the heat, that's best. Yeah. All right. Thanks, N.A., for, for joining us and for the question. Hopefully that helps. Um, and thank you all. We've, we've run out of time. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back on Wednesday at noon with Jen and Morrow to answer more curb appeal questions and to talk about a project that they're working on together. So thanks again, Nathan. Thank you, guys. Good talking to you, Chris. You too, as always. All right, have a great week. Happy Monday. Bye, everyone.